testing the technology. Well, what a privilege and an honour to be in your company today. And um, I'm really grateful to Foundation Ireland for giving us this slot. So we're going to um, something a little different from, from previous uh, presentations, which is extraordinary and very inspiring, so thank you. Um, but we're going to talk about how we are working together to address societal challenges through engaged research and innovation. So, um, we've just come out of a pandemic. We're all fairly exhausted, um, trying to get back into spaces and work together and be together and share these types of experiences. Um, and it is, am I, am I missing a microphone? Can everyone hear me? Okay, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. So, back to talking about working together to address societal challenges. So, the world is facing wicked, complex societal challenges. We flick on the television and there we go. We can see what these we understand on a day-to-day -day basis. We open the television and we see time and time again, it's the housing crisis. It's the rising temperatures of the globe and the destruction of our biodiversity across Ireland and, and globally. It's a persistent crisis in health service and the, the implementation issues around implementation around policy um, relating to, to all of the above. Um, the, the energy crisis, of course, which is, of course, giving way to um, um, consumer crisis and, and cost of living crisis, and they're all experiencing today. So, we have a problem. These issues are interconnected. They're very often value-based, you know, involving lots of different stakeholders, lots of opinions, lots of values. Um, and if you do one thing in one space, it often negatively can affect, you know, um, um, other key stakeholders. Um, looking at, you know, emissions and so on, and the farming community is a good example and on every newspaper you open these days. So, what is the problem? The problem is that we are moving too slow. We're investing billions of euros into research and innovation, but change is too slow. And the, the issue here is that many of these societal challenges, we need to be acting faster and we need to be seeing change at a, at a, at a, at a, at a more rapid pace. We're putting, again, to mention, we're putting so much money into, into trying to solve these challenges, and people are not seeing the return on this investment fast enough and growing apathetic. They're feeling bootless, useless, and how can they be a part of this process to address these societal challenges? Well, here's one concept and a vision and, a, and something to inspire people to, to think about how they do research and how, um, how they, they implement their research projects. And this is around engaged research and innovation. So what is it all about? What is engaged research and innovation about? Well, it's about bringing the beneficiaries of our research and innovation into the research process at the very beginning, before we put pen to paper, before we start thinking of project planning, we're talking with the beneficiaries of research, planning what those essential outputs should be, what are the, the outcomes we want to achieve together, and how do we drive the necessary outcomes for impact across societal impact. So it's this piece of working together to exchange tacit knowledge and to work to understand the cause and effect of these challenges together. So again, this is about collective transdisciplinary research. Um, and we talk about transdisciplinary research, we're talking about that quadruple helix. So how is industry working with society, with communities? How are they working with government and policy officials and the academic community and researchers and innovators? And in addition, we have to start thinking about moving beyond just measuring and discussing the, 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 the mobilization of research outputs um, and start thinking bigger. We're only hearing half of the story when we're talking about research impact. We need to think about the greater societal impact of research across health, well-being, environment, across the arts, culture, and so on. 
Because at the moment, our, our infrastructures and our tools and our systems, we're only talking about the IP and the tech, but we need to understand how we're changing people's behaviours, cultures, and never before really have we seen the, the, the power of working together, putting in and investing large sums of money to address societal challenges as we did through the, through, the, through the pandemic. And of course, fundamental to this was strong leadership, which we had in abundance in Ireland. So this is about getting it right quicker. This is about getting people on board the research process from the beginning to save time, save money, and to accelerate impact. And who doesn't want to do that? Um, so it really is about a kind of a cultural and attitudinal change. And we all know that we can have many a strategy, but culture will eat that strategy unless we're really working bottom up, top down, bringing people on board this process. So this is very much now not even an option for, for, for um, big funding calls. And particularly when we look at, at Europe and what the European Commission is doing in terms of its very large societal um, mission-based funding calls, embedded in these funding calls, it's critical that you are working again with these beneficiaries of the research. And Europe, it's, it's very interesting what Europe is doing. It's putting 95 billion of a wager backing it in research and innovation, understanding that the only way we can bring um, economic um, prosperity and pick ourselves up is through research and innovation. And as part of that, the concept of the European Union, the, this process of deliberative democracy through the research and innovation process, and then also embedding the equality, the diversity and inclusion in that in those core criteria for doing for doing engage in doing engaged research and innovation. In addition, Science Foundation Ireland, challenge-based funding calls are primarily engaged research, um, which is just wonderful to see now that we have this type of political momentum. Um, and I would I would argue that this we have a competitive edge in Ireland. You know, we are an interesting country at the moment on the globe due to various economic and social policy issues. So Ireland, this, this small little country on the Western Front, um, you know, we are a dynamic, interconnected society. We talk to each other. We have access to speak to leaders. We have opportunity to become more connected um, and really in, embed this kind of bottom-up and top-down consultative process um, in, in terms of the, the implementation of policy. We have a department dedicated to further higher education, research, innovation and science. And as part of that process, we also have now a, a new strategy, um, Impact 2030, where engagement and uh, the Creating Our Future initiative, it is embedded in, in this new strategy. And it's part of how we will measure and manage um, the, the, the success and the impact of research and innovation is by, is by monitoring how that Impact 2030 strategy is delivered. Um, again, we have our new evidence unit within the department, which I think is one of the, 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 the best things to happen in the last 12 months. It's such an important, we have colleagues here today, um, Joe and Leonora and Trudy and Deirdre, of course, will be speaking later. I think this is a really significant turning point. Um, and the message here is that research and innovation needs to step up build those partnerships with our policy officials to work together um, to understand their role and the responsibility of researchers to work through policy instruments, but also to implement policy, to support the implementation of policy. Ireland has an issue with we write beautiful policy and we can construct and we can dialogue and consult, but often the implementation piece is where we trip up. Um, so again, we have the societal challenge, this, this funding, the 65 euro, million euro at the moment to invest in these key priority, mainly emanating from Europe with these top key priority areas. Um, so just to backtrack a little on our new unit, you know, and to really, we've been doing a little bit of picking around and investigative work um, with Campus Engage based in the Irish Universities Association. And we've been engaging with Peter Peter and uh, Trudy and a number of really amazing researchers across the system and uh, very senior and not so senior civil servants um, who have created these trusting, effective partnerships to work together to inform public 
policy. And they've been ta talking to us about these nodes or these sparks or these opportunities for researchers to build these trusting, these trusting, trusting relationships. And what we've done with these research findings, if we have spun them out into certain tools such as a training program that we have now delivered, I'm going to talk a little bit about later. But ultimately, this is about the researchers engaging. Researchers are our brokers with society to understand cause effect and then to, to look and to, to figure out what ways to collect, manage that data and translate that data specifically for these policy officials, which is really going to become a much more hotter topic and something people need to get on the bus and start changing their skills or up building their skills to do. So what we are about here is about changing attitudes, changing culture, we need to change the infrastructure and the roles of our institutions, and we need to build human capacity to do that. So what I'm going to do now is pass you on to my, my new friend and colleague, Professor Derek O'Keefe, who is going to talk to you a little bit about his experience and case studies of engaged research. How are you? My name is, is Derek, uh, and I'm a Limerick man, so it's great to be home. Uh, and as you heard, I'm a professor of medical device technology at the University of Galway and a consultant physician at University Hospital Galway. And when you heard a little bit about my bio there, you might have heard that I did medicine and engineering. So I'm a physician here. So I did a degree in electronic engineering at UL, a master's of computer engineering, a PhD of biomedical engineering, then went to Harvard, did a postdoc. And the people I worked with there were on the HST program, the Health Sciences Technology program, because you might know in the States you have to do um, a degree before you do medicine. It's a graduate program. And so the people I worked with, they were really strong engineering, but they had also done medicine at Harvard. And they had suggested to me that I should be a physician here too. And I thought it was a great idea at the time. So I went back then and did more training uh, in medicine uh, and then did my clinical training both here in Ireland and across the pond again at the Mayo Clinic. And then in 2019, I got a permanent job in Galway and my father cried. He was so happy I got a permanent job and I was finished college. So, so as a physician here, engineers are very problem solving, you know, logical, solutions orientated. And anyone who works as a clinician knows that the clinical world is full of problems. Uh, it's a spectrum of color, nothing is ever black and white. And, and therefore there's a great opportunity for innovation when those two worlds meet. And the first example I'm going to give you of that is actually, it happened across the road during my PhD in, in St. Camillus's Hospital, the rehab hospital here in Nimerick. Um, and I remember at the time, this is 2001-ish, uh, way before, you know, um, touchscreen technology was, was mainstream. And I was developing an electronic stimulator for somebody with stroke for rehab. And I spent about a month programming this new generation technology of touchscreen and, you know, doing the electronics and the software programming for it. And I brought it across to an eight-year-old woman in St. Camillus's. And I showed it to her and I said, so this will control the stimulation intensity for muscle rehab. And, and she was, you know, playing with it for a while. And she said to me, could you not just make it like a, a little dial or a knob that's on a radio to turn up the intensity? And I remember thinking, ah, I should probably should have spoken to you a month ago. Uh, and then I just did it that weekend, a much simpler solution, which is what she needed. And that, in, in essence, is what we're talking about today. Traditionally, research comes from the bench and goes to the bedside, whereas what we're seeing now is a new paradigm of bedside to bench to bedside. And that's called PPI, for example, you know, public patient involvement in science, or it's called engaged research. And in my area of digital health research, what's really uh, after happening is this Cambrian explosion of technology. So if you know your geology, the planet that we live on, third rock from the sun, it's here about 4.5 billion years. Okay, about 3.5 billion years ago, we got life on this, this rock. And about half a billion years ago, something really strange happened. We had an explosion in complex life on Earth called the Cambrian explosion. And we think it's because this big band biological moment happened because of increasing oxygen. Uh, and then life flourished. And that's what's happening with technology now. Right now in the 2020s, this decade, with the rise of that computer in your pocket, that smartphone, coupled with what we're seeing now, which is 5G, is going to lead to this internet of things that we haven't even thought of half the ideas for yet. But in healthcare in particular, it's going to transform what we consider the delivery of healthcare to be. Because we're going to focus much more on the part of the journey when people are well and preventative than what we do at the moment, which is when they're sick. And when I came back to Ireland with that permanent job uh, in 2019, I gave a TED talk called Digital Doctors. It's on YouTube. Uh, that's 2019 BC, before COVID. 
Um, and, you know, as, as, a, as a doctor who sees patients in the clinic, I used to, to say to myself and to my patients and to everyone who I work with, why is somebody driving two hours from Clifton to spend 30 minutes parking in a, a hospital car park to wait in a waiting room for two hours to see me for 10 minutes? That makes no, no sense, no matter what your metric is, economic, time, environmental. Surely we could just deliver the same chronic disease management care virtually. Now, you still have to come into the hospital now and then, but a lot of it can be delivered virtually. Um, and it's kind of like what we're doing with banking. You know, most banking now is digital to digital, but now and then you physically have to go into the bank. So I talked about this in 2019, and then, of course, there was a big bang moment which allowed us to uh, accelerate a lot of these things. And, and this is the clinical team that I work with. So I work half my time in the hospital as a doctor, and what we're trying to do in Galway is bring those technical solutions into the clinic, as I mentioned. So I set up the Hive Lab in 2019, the health innovation via engineering. And, and like a, a Hive, I mean, I... I have what I call specialist syndrome. The more you know, the more you, 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 the more you know, the more you, you know you don't know. And what, what I mean by that is, is you need to have a lot of experts at the table. It can't just be you as a physician engineer. You need to have health psychologists, other clinicians, other engineers, uh, people with different skill sets. And like a, a real hive, only through collaboration then you can achieve a, a good outcome. So we're, we're very focused on medical technology. In my own specialist area of diabetes, there's a lot of technology in that area. We're looking at novel robotics uses in the hospital to help patients uh, learn about their chronic diseases, and we're tied in with CORM, obviously, the Centre for Medical Device Technology, and LIRO. And, and what we try and do at the, at the Hive Lab is this shamrock, as I call it, of clinical world, academic world, industry world coming together for the patient. Uh, and it's really important to have all those elements there to make it successful. And one of the examples that was featured earlier this year through an IUA initiative on RTE was this HAPNAV device. So this patient here, and she doesn't mind me speaking about her uh, because she wants to tell people about the story. Her name is Sinead. She has diabetes type 1, um, or um, a Modi subset of it. And she, unfortunately, she went blind from diabetes in her 20s. And she works as a nurse, and she still works as a nurse to manage the phone service. But she came to the clinic one day as a patient. And as a doctor, you know, I, I'm very interested in the, the biological biomarkers. So I said to her, you know, how's your blood pressure? How's your blood sugar? How's your blood cholesterol? Which are all the things we're trying to keep in the right range per guidelines internationally. But, but then as a, as a human and as a, as a clinician that's patient focused, I said, how's life? What's it like being you know, blind at, in your mid twenties? And she said, you know, it's okay, I can get on with it, but you know, it can be quite cumbersome, this white stick that I have. And she said, you know, 200 years of using a white cane to get around, surely someone could develop some better technology than that. Because alternatively, I've got to wait for a guide dog, which takes five years. And you know, there must be some better way that doesn't feel as cumbersome when I go to a bar or a restaurant than to bring out this two meter cane. And we thought about that. And we developed this device that you see here that emits a, an ultrasound signal like a bat and then gives you feedback uh, to let you know how far away objects are so she can build up a 3D internal spatial picture in her head. But the reason I'm telling you this story is Sinead was on the design team. So the first version of this we built was the size of a baseball glove. And we gave it to her and she said, that's really amazing. That's exactly what will replace the, the white cane, but I'll never use it because it's too big. And then we're like, all right, good point. And then, you know, the next version, next version, eventually we got to this version, which is what she uses now. But it shows you the importance of having somebody who the product is for at the table, at the design table. So they're helping you design the questionnaire, not just taking the questionnaire, if that's the, the other way of putting it. Another example is, uh, again, my first year of practice. Here in Ireland, there was a big storm, Ophelia, if you remember, everywhere got flooded. Practically speaking, what that meant is, a, you know, I have a clinic of 50 patients, and we started getting phone calls saying, I can't come to the clinic, doc, because I'm flooded in, in Galway or in Mayo or wherever. Uh, and we were like, that's okay, we can reschedule your clinic appointment and so on. But then people said, yeah, yeah, but I have type 1 diabetes, and I need to take insulin every day, and I only have about three or four days left of my supply. What will I do? I can't get out of my farm. And at the time, I remember thinking, uh, yeah, what do you do when, you're, when you can? I mean, you can't sell helicopters to everybody. So what do you do? And the only thing we could do at the time was actually just look at the weather forecast and say, it looks like the weather's going to get better. You'll be okay in about three days. You should be able to get to the pharmacy. And thankfully, that's what happened. But, you know, that doesn't always happen. So I, at the time, I looked into what happened in Hurricane Katrina, for example, when the flood went on for longer. Uh, and unfortunately, what happened was people died with chronic diseases and couldn't get access to their medicines. So at the time, I thought, you know, why not get a solution that, you know, we all probably know about drones and why can we use them to deliver medicines? But the challenge with drones is they're not regulated to fly beyond the line of horizon. So we put this project together with the Hive Lab, with different people involved to try and uh, bring dr drones from the toy shop, really, into the commercial world, into commercial airspace, and to get all the regulators involved, the Irish Aviation Airspace, 
the pharmaceutical regulations, the medical regulations, because it's lots of things you have to think about when you're delivering medicines. And we did it. We did it in 2019, the world's first delivery of a medicine in controlled airspace. Um, and from that now, there's great enterprise coming out of Europe uh, in the area of commercial drones. This new project that we're working on now, uh, uh, supported by Science Foundation Ireland, is the Clare Island Health Project. And it's, it's, it's what I spoke about two years ago. So rather than those patients coming down from Clare Island, getting a ferry across, driving for two hours, coming to the hospital and so on, we're, we've started to deliver care to them remotely. Uh, and again, it's a very collaborative project with the islanders. In fact, the first time I went out to the island to tell them what we were planning to do, um, I, like they had a hall like this, there was 50 islanders present, and I said, right, so this is a great idea, hands up who support this, and everyone had their arms folded. And I couldn't understand because I thought this was a great idea and so on, but I was really glad I came to the island to, to find out who'd be taking up on it. And when we broke into different work groups to figure out what was going on, it turned out they thought that we were going to take away their GP and the nurse on the island. And then I was like, ah, 20 years later, I'm still learning from the people who this is for. So it was really important to have them in early in the project, and so much so we actually have island representatives or a PPI group on our project helping us to design the different work packages. Um, and what we're doing is, you know, first generation of telemedicine is ring somebody and see how you're doing. That's what we had to do in COVID at short notice. The second generation is video consultation where you can see somebody and they can hold up their medication packet and so on. The next generation is video consultation with remote monitoring of data, which is what we're doing at the moment on Clare Island. So I had a consultation on Friday evening and I saw a patient, you know, video consultation. And then on the other screen, I could see all their blood sugar data, their weight data, their blood pressure data and so on. I could have a real meaningful discussion then about their sugar insulin ratios and so on. And what we're doing beyond this now, uh, starting in the new year, is what I call dynamic consults. So no matter where you see a doctor in the world, the doctor sees you today and says, okay, Mrs. O'Malley, you're doing okay. I think I'll see you in about nine months time. And they make that clinical judgment based on their experience, your medical record, and then your presentation today. But they have no idea if you walk out in next month or the month after, if you suddenly, you know, God forbid, got diagnosed with cancer and have to go on chemotherapy, that your whole, you know, blood sugars might go out of range or your blood pressure. So what we're trialing on this project is what I call dynamic appointments. So the AI will look at the data streams and then triage people appropriately to see the clinician depending on need. Um, and so that's going to be a really powerful example of using technology for clinical benefit. And just to point out again, these two members of that team, Jack here on the left, is a full-time PPI representative on the project. Um, and we actually won an award recently for the PPI um, involvement in the project. So it's a really important part of research. Uh, I'd argue that it's going to be the future of research, having engaged research. It saves time, it saves money, and it accelerates impact, which is really important. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll hand you back to Kate. And now very briefly, because I think we're over our time, is to, um, to officially launch the second iteration of the Campus Engage uh, six-week Train the Trainer course. So this is to scale up our, the number of leaders and experts in across your centres and institutes who can do engaged research and innovation uh, planning for, for projects and implement projects. So it's, it's live now on Twitter, while Twitter still exists. And it's a six-week course, and it's, the content is all informed really through dialogue with our core uh, funding agencies, Royal Irish Academy, EPA, SFI, HRB, all the Enterprise Ireland, and um, um, TIA, and the Health Research Charities Ireland, who've been exceptionally helpful. And it's a six-week course, and you, the, 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 the learners come out as facilitators at the end. So this is about rapidly scaling capacity and competency in engaged research methods, and methodological approaches, how we work together to plan and implement for societal impact, um, those sparks and key enablers for working with policy officials to inform policy, public policy, implement, evaluate public policy, and scale what works, and then on monitoring and assessing how well you have done across your research projects. So these are all our, our partners, our existing partners, who've already taken the first iteration of training, um, and here are all their lovely faces. So this is a community of practice that we've now embedded across the country. These are valuable assets to your centre. This is where the, the insights are, so you need to get these guys, you need to be asking them on a weekly basis, where's our training? Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll pack you, pass you on now. Take care.
so thanks very much, Kate and Derek. We do have a question that came in on the oh, slide. No, no. Yeah, that's okay. It's an easy one. Don't worry. Um, so it's from Joe, and it says, as a PI, what are some practical first steps to commencing engaged research? So, that's Kate, if you a few so thoughts Joe, on that. How are you? Um, so a good starting point um, in engaged research is getting out and talking to community organisations, I would argue, because within these non-governmental organisations, there's very passionate people who want to be involved in processes of change, but also, again, these, you know, working with industry equally want to deliver societal impact. So get out and talk, get on organisations, advisory boards, um, committees, um, attend um, non-academic conferences, well, I mean, where there's academic research presentations, but these are brilliant hives of activity um, for finding research partners, because the vital thing here is that you have a good uh, partner to work with. And often that one is that snowball effect, is you get one person, um, so living, uh, you know, a, 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 so the Brian, Brian's work in, in, in Dingle is an extraordinary example, the Dingle 2030 project, and how he's actually changing um, consumer behaviours and so on, um, and um, how people are retrofitting their houses and whatnot, by building local community uh, infrastructures to talk to, to go where the people are. You know, it's all so, about the people. Yeah, it's it is all about the people. Thanks very much, Kate. Thanks for that.